New Zealander in such good form. Has this in him every day of the week. Hamish Kerr, oh dear. And he is facing elimination. It was just terror. Like, I, I genuinely just, like, my legs buckled midway through my run-up because I was just so nervous. Like, oh, I just yeah. had jelly legs. You know, failing to jump 220 in, like, a global competition where you've jumped 236 that year, is, it, it's not good. You know, I was sort of sitting there just thinking, like, maybe I just don't have it. Like, maybe, maybe you know, I can be the best guy in the world, and yet when the pressure truly, truly comes on, I'm just not good for it. Kerr clears easily. Oh my goodness, Hamish, what are you doing to us? If I hadn't got that, I probably would have had to retire. Oh, what a lad. Well, today I'm lucky enough to be joined by the man who can jump higher than any other human being on the planet, Hamish Kerr. Welcome, mate. <laughs> Thanks for having me, mate. It's, yeah, I'm just stoked to be here, eh? It's mate, really great. <laughs> huge honour um, having you in the studio. And I, I guess your life's um, probably changed a fair bit over the last sort of few months since the success over there in Paris. Yeah, yeah, it, it has. It's it's definitely a um, few more people wanting a bit, bit more of my time, which, yeah. is, which is nice at times. So, uh, yeah, no, it's been awesome. It's... Yeah, probably a little bit unprecedented. Like, I mean, obviously everyone does tune in for the games and it's it's just, you know, over and above the biggest thing that we do as, as track and field athletes. But, yeah, to really experience that um, for yourself is, is just something completely different. Yeah, what's been the biggest difference for you? Obviously, people wanting your time, but people recognise you in the street. Is it? I think, to be honest, like, probably the biggest one is actually airports. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it is, but airports, people just, like, have permission to say, like, oh, get on, yeah. And, like, I mean, I love it. Like, it's it's not it's not an issue. But you used to just spend your time at the airport. Yeah, well, I spend my time at the airport, but also every time I go through, it just seems like I just get, you know, accosted by everyone as I yeah. go through. And, and yeah. yeah, you sort of go to the supermarket, people are a bit more chill and don't really say anything, which is which is kind of nice. But, yeah, when you're... When you when you tr- when you're travelling, which I do a lot of nowadays, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's just constant constant people sort of congratulating you and just just telling you you know how proud they are to be a Kiwi and all the rest of it. Yeah, so cool. How how much of your life is on the road? Um, quite a bit. Yeah. So so probably for the last couple of years now, I've been about six months overseas, six months here, oh, yeah. um, and that's that's mainly because uh, all of our competitions are in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a small domestic season, um, well, small for me, I don't do a huge amount of that nowadays, uh, and so that's sort of uh, January, February, March, um, so I'd usually be at home for that, uh, and then once it starts getting cold here, I head over <laughs> and get amongst the summer, so yeah, definitely could be worse, but yeah, about 50-50 at the moment. Yeah, and wife, you've got a, as a partner, partner. Yeah, yeah. does she travel with you? She is starting to travel a wee bit more yeah. with me, which is quite nice, um, I think that's definitely one of the hardest things that I sort of had to contend with early in my career was obviously, you know, not being a, a you know a super financially viable sport at the best of times yeah. um you know i was was spending some some long roads by myself uh you know mm-hmm. in some quite lonely places so uh yeah it's it's been good that you know as my career's progressed and and you know the, the various rewards that come with that it's just meant that you know i've got a little bit more uh resource to bring a you know first and foremost coach along uh for a lot of it now but then mm-hmm. also um yeah to to bring Maddie along as well as as you know, it's such a cool part of our life to be able to sort of travel the world together and, and just experience all of that. Yeah, does, does she jump as well? She's a heptathlete, so so seven events. Um, yeah, just exhausting. Just watching her train and, and what <laughs> she does. It's it's yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, but yeah, she's she's sort of hoping that you know in the next few years, if if she can start taking it more seriously and, and really push on, that you know potentially she's not just travelling with me, but also doing a lot of travel for herself so yeah it's going to be cool to support that how cool is that like your kids are going to have some <laughs> genetics for a track and field <laughs> yeah i don't know if they're going to be doing track and field mate but uh, we'll see <laughs> and you sort of mentioned the the loneliness of um being an individual athlete i get the vibe that you're um you know you, you like being around people you, you you seem like a team guy um is that one of the hardest parts of high jump yes Yes, yeah, it probably would be to be honest. Yeah, um, I think I think for me, I I would say I'm a I'm a sort of a bookend personality. Like I do love spending a lot of time with people, and yeah. I love I love sort of you know the energy that I can get from my competitors and my friends and family and my training partners and stuff. But at the same time, yeah, I don't mind a little bit of time alone. Yeah, and, and I think that you know as an individual athlete, I'd definitely be lying to say that you know that isn't something that that really gets me going as well. Mm. Um, you know, I, I obviously 
am an individual athlete and do need to kind of have that element. But yeah, it, it was tough. Like I think, yeah, sort of the the glamorousness of of traveling and and being an athlete gets gets worn off pretty quickly when you when you head over to Europe by yourself and you know you sort of get off the plane and and you're in an unfamiliar country and you've got you know no support network yeah. with you other than you know on your phone and and everyone back home's asleep so you've got no one to contact <laughs> and it's sort of like ah oh, okay like what's next so yeah I think that is that is definitely something that is is tough to contend with but at the same time I think that's what I love about um, individual sports because. You know, at the end of the day, no one's really telling me that I have to do anything. Mm. It's not like I'm, you know, part of a team. It's not like there's a necessarily like a culture that I have to adhere to. I don't have to turn up to training when all the boys are there. And it's it's kind of just how hard I want to push mm. uh, and and how, you know, deeply I want to commit. And, you know, the the, res- the rewards from that or the, the failures from that uh, are mine and, and, and I get to wear them and, and learn from them and grow from them. So, yeah, it's it's... It's a weird space. It's de- definitely very different to to what um, you know the typical probably Kiwi sportsman does, mm. um, being you know very team sport heavy country. But at the same time, I mean, I've got a massive team around me now um, of of support people who push me along and, and definitely help me on that journey. Yeah, man, that's interesting. And when you say like you're in charge of your week, so your structure, your weekly schedule is purely down to whatever you want. Um, yeah, hopefully none of my support team are watching this because <laughs> they probably would disagree. But <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, ultimately, yes. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I've obviously got a lot of people who are who are keeping me accountable. But at the end of the day, that's only because I put them around me, mm-hmm. um, and and that's been my decision. It's it's not like I've had an amazing talent that's been you know snapped up by a, an organisation and and they've tried to really build something. It's 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 sort of been about what I want and what my needs are and and how I feel like I want my kind of journey to be to be progressed through sport and and mm. and I get to sort of put my little brand on that and I think that's something that you know you, you t- we talk about all the time you know tiny country producing world class athletes and and you know high jumpers the first ever one we've ever had and, yeah. and you know the first medals and all the rest of it but I think part of that is just the fact that I have been able to forge that um that destiny myself and and really be able to put my kind of brand on it yeah man that, that is so cool and I'm keen to hear a little bit more about how you got into it so keen to go back to the start where it all sort of started for you I know you you're born in Dunedin weren't you yeah yeah bounced around I, I just like to say I'm a true Kiwi um, proud <laughs> Kiwi so yeah grew up well born in Dunedin uh, mum and dad met down there and, and got married down there and spent you know the the first few years of their relationship down there but then ultimately moved to Auckland oh yeah uh, and so was pretty much there from about three years old oh, yeah. um, so yeah, probably spent. Well, I I have spent the most amount of my time in my life in Auckland, um, yeah. and all kind of through my schooling years, I was I was based out of there. So, yeah, I guess I just say I'm the the primary school kid who never grew up. <laughs> uh, you know, everyone everyone loves athletics day back. At, you know, well, most people love athletics day back in the um, back in primary school and, yeah. and high jumps. Always, you know, that that cool one that you get to. You know, do the manu over the bar and land on the <laughs> mat, and it's it's just something about it that, that everyone loves. And and I guess that probably developed a love. I mean, first and foremost, a love of sport. Um, you know, I, I was an active kid. I, I played rugby and football, yeah. and you know, just just did all the things that the Kiwi kids do. And um, my particular thing that I was good at was running. Um, I was pretty quick, uh, and and I seemed to always you know win cross country and be right up there in the sprints. And so. Naturally, uh, I joined an athletics club, and so that was sort of probably my first experience of, of slightly more formalised athletics. Yeah, uh, and I was really lucky actually. I was at Roscoe South, which is a club up in Auckland, and and we had the Iwani brothers, and we had, you know, uh, a couple of other sort of Super Rugby guys who are still playing now, and and just this really good kind of core unit of of guys who are who were just fun to be around and, and just good mates, but also really talented. True. You yeah. weren't quicker than Rico were you at uh, school. <laughs> 50-50, yeah. I, I think, I, think I, I beat him a couple times, like, real young. Um, like, I'm, say, I'm saying sort of like 10 or 11 oh, years yeah, old. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. then, and then once he started... It all counts. Once he started growing, uh, he definitely had, <laughs> he had my number. So um, That's when you went to high jump. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's when I hung the boots up and, and let him just do what he does now. So, uh, you know could say that I taught him what he knows and all the rest of it but <laughs> no I think that was what was awesome was that we had this real core group of guys yeah. um who who just who just loved it and just wanted to to get down there on a Tuesday night and do club night and and just you know support each other and just be competitive so yeah, yeah I, I guess it sort of grew from there um I still did a lot of distance running that was kind of my main passion for most of my high school 
uh, and then I ultimately, yeah, sort of just got lazier and lazier as I got older <laughs> and sort of did less and less of the distance running and, and each year kind of stepped down a distance from sort of 15 to 800 to 400 and kind of all through this I, I did do high jump as well and, and it was kind of the event that I was I was definitely the best at like I, I would kind of you know battle out for like a fifth place in the 15 and then go and like medal in the high jump at you know club day or whatever so yeah. it was it was sort of the thing that that I was the best at but there was no future in it like I didn't see you know, I didn't have heroes, I didn't have people I looked up to in that space and I never really saw it as something that I could go on to be an elite or a professional or anything. So, mm. so yeah, so I, I suppose that's probably why I didn't really commit to it. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, you know, went to uni and, and gave it away for two years just because, it, you know, it, I wasn't in a position that I could kind of step into that next that next level and, and I think that, you know, leaving high school, and this is a big thing for a lot of sports, but especially athletics, is... I jumped two fourteen at the end of high school, which is far out. Wow, that's massive. I mean, it, it is like, and it's 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 it was sort of the seventh highest jump um, by a Kiwi ever, and, and I think I was one of the youngest guys to ever achieve seven foot, which is seven, uh, which is two fourteen. Yeah. So, so that was a that was a massive achievement. But then ultimately, like, if I wanted to, you know, get onto the the circuit and and start doing all the elite stuff, like I was having to jump high twenties, so it mm-hmm. would have been two twenty eight, two twenty nine. So you know, as a as an eighteen year old you know a 10 centimeter increase which is probably a you know a two three year goal it it just wasn't on my bingo card eh? like it was it was yeah. just something i wasn't prepared to do and so and you know that's that's symptomatic of a lot of a lot of athletes i think um especially coming out of high school so yeah went away did uni but ultimately just missed it like i just i just missed the yeah just the single-mindedness and and just the enjoyment and, and passion and you know just being out there with my mates out out in the outdoors just just absolutely sending it so that's kind of <laughs> Kind of why I came back, and uh, yeah, I guess the rest is history. So to be able to jump, what was it, two seventeen at school? How much work were you putting into to get to that sort of goal? Uh, not a huge amount. I'm Just be naturally, naturally <laughs> yeah. gifted. Yeah, I think. Look, I mean, that's what is cool about the sport is is that you, it's so easily measurable. Like mm. you know, the, you do a personal best. You do. It doesn't matter where in the world you're jumping. There's a there's a specific height that you're going to clear, yeah. and so I think that you know, as a as a high school kid, every year I just got a little bit better because I tried a bit harder, mm. I guess. And so you know, when I was when I was in year nine, I jumped one seventy eight. Oh, I remember, yeah. which was which was awesome. But you know, like ultimately, I think I came tenth place at nationals or something. Yeah, and it's definitely not something to write home about. But um, yeah, each year I I probably pushed a little bit harder. I think I jumped, you know. I mean, there was a few growing years in there as well, so I, you know it wasn't all linear. But you know, every year I probably improved by a few centimeters, a few centimeters, a few centimeters, and and that was down to probably just training a little bit harder each year. Mm. I you know I got to uh, year thirteen and and obviously jumped two fourteen, uh, and I wouldn't say that I was taking it you know that seriously. It was yeah. probably the first year I did kind of really basic like weights, um, and at that point I was probably training probably three or four times a week, yeah. um, just down at the local track, but. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a it's such an intense sport on your body, um, track and field, because you know you're you're just trying to push yourself to your absolute limit all the time. That ultimately, for me, being you know six foot six mm-hmm. uh, through that high school years, the fact that I didn't push as hard as some other people probably did was actually good. Um, it meant that I was actually able to grow and, and build into my body. And yeah. I think yeah, if I'd really sent it from from when I was a kid. You know, there's a chance that I might not have actually been able to grow properly and yeah. get to the the heights I did. And something that is, you know, super necessary as an athlete is, is being tall. Were you always tall? Were you tall from a? Ki- yeah, I was. I was. I was always kind of like the tallest kid in the class. Yeah, um, but never, never like disgustingly tall. Like yeah, I think, yeah. I think it was sort of one of those things that every year I sort of everyone just said, "Oh yeah, you know, you're going to stop." Like you know, you've already had your growth spurt, but ultimately, like I, I just kind of kept on growing and growing. But <laughs> I think by about year sort of 11, 12, I was probably about one ninety five. Oh yeah, kind of eked out a couple, couple more centimeters when I came down here and worked on some posture stuff. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and other sports like you mentioned the running, but um, rugby. I'm, I'm guessing you're a lock, but sometimes I'm surprised. Well, yeah, prepared to be surprised. Um, I I think probably the biggest thing that I hated about rugby was the contact. Yeah. I was just a real, like, 
real pussy when it came to that stuff. <laughs> so um, no, I was outside back. I, Wing it. I just loved running it. Um, yeah, I suppose chuck- you're the fastest. You're faster than Rico, so you were out well, there. Oh, exactly. The wing with him. Oh yeah, it's just actually reminded me. There was we. I played his school in primary school, uh, in like the interzones touch tournament. Yeah, and one of the and he he won't even remember this, uh, but I I got around him. Um, this I kind of knew who he was because we were at the same same athletics club and 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 sort of had clashed a little bit over the years just in sport. And yeah, I vividly remember. <laughs> I just remember. This. I was running down the wing and I got around him. And he like dived to try and get me because he, I was sort of stretching away. Yeah. And to this day, he claimed that he got me. And they, did, they didn't call it. They did not call it. And I ended up scoring that try. And yeah, it was it was definitely a um, source of argument for a, for a little bit. But um, yeah, that's my that's my sporting claim to fame. But yeah, touch rugby great for me. Uh, contact not awesome. Um, yeah. And that was sort of ultimately why I didn't push rugby further. Is that. Yeah, just just kind of, yeah, being a skinny skinny fella, um, you know, starting to play in, you know, the older and older mm. weight grades, it, it just just didn't really fit my my build. So yeah, yeah did away. the basketball coaches come calling? They usually try and find the tallest guy in the school and try and recruit him. No, nah, not really. Eh? Like I went to so I went to Auckland Grammar, um, and we we had it was a pretty big sporting school, um, mm. and I think that yeah, genuinely like there were there were boys in the basketball team taller than me. So I think that yeah. If, if it had been different, um, potentially, but one of the ones that actually tried to sort of poach me a wee bit was Rowan, oh, yeah. um, which was obviously a big one for us, so uh, being traditional boys' school. So, yeah, definitely definitely had a few chats with the Rowan coach, but I think at the end of the day, like, probably the thing that put a lot of those school um, school coaches off was just my attitude, eh? Like, <laughs> you know, even the even the athletics coaches, they were just, you yeah, know, they'd just tear their hair out because they'd be like, oh, good, okay. you know, like, you could be so good. You know, you just got to commit a little bit more, be like yeah but see like I don't want to come in or like I just want to I'm good enough like it's fine so yeah I think I think just that love and, and that, that passion but just that enjoyment um yeah it was never about the performance for me it was just yeah. about the enjoyment so when did that mindset change yeah it's a good question I I don't think it ever really fully did like I think that for me like that is the reason I get out of bed every morning is that mm. I love what I do uh I think I, I think that the the lens definitely changed after Tokyo, yeah. Uh, so, so obviously made made that games, and that was my first. Um, well, it was it was pretty much my first really big major competition. Um, COVID killed me a wee bit. I made World Champs twenty nineteen, and so that was sort of that twenty twenty year was going to be my consolidation and and really sort of break onto the tour. And then obviously that all dried up pretty quickly, and so we sort of had eighteen months back here. But yeah, I think going to the the Tokyo Games was probably a big step in the, the direction of like, you know, this is actually something I could take seriously mm. and, and, and really push forward and, and be one of the best in the world. Um, I think that I, I saw all those guys and, and what they were doing and, and, you know, the guys who were better than me. And, uh, yeah, I don't want to say I wasn't impressed, but it, it definitely put it in perspective for me that I wasn't actually that far away from them. Yeah. Um, and so I think that was quite cool in a way to, to sort of see that and go like, look, like, there's some things that are really good at, you know, especially the Europeans, like the technique that they have is, is just drilled in from such a young age and, and they're just so consistent and and they're used to competing in those big meets because they have so many of them. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, the, the small Kiwi Kiwi fella from, you know, the, the Saturday meets with 20, 20 people watching to, to go into a full stadium. It's, You've won the comp on your first jump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's a little bit of a different uh, mindset, but I think I think that I sort of saw that I actually had some 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 you know, I suppose feathers in my cap that that were more developed than them as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that that those were the things that made me realise like oh, like I could actually be here, mm. um, and not just enjoy the space, but also you know dominate the space. Yeah, man, that's cool. So, what's your pathway from when you you quit at uni, and then you're at the Olympics, what's that sort of pathway for a high jumper? Yeah, so I I was getting to the end of my degree, um, so I did a I did a Bachelor of Agricultural Commerce. Oh yeah, uh, and you at, finished it? Yeah, finished it. Um, so I did that in Palmy, um, of all places. So yeah. that was you know awesome part of my life. I think that it gave me a lot of perspective. You know, I was a city boy, so yeah. I went into that space um, wanting to do something commerce related, but. Also had this idea that I that I loved the outdoors and, and wanted to stay in New Zealand ultimately and you know 
what's what's our biggest industry agriculture right so yeah. we you know i might as well get into that and, and just see where that takes me so yeah it was definitely a different part of my life um you know going in there and you know having having people off farms and essentially saying like oh you know we're in palmy now it's the big smoke <laughs> <laughs> you know i've just come from central auckland and <laughs> sort of never seen a cow pat in my life but uh, no that was that was awesome like i think that it was it was really formative and, and I was actually really lucky because there was a good athletics club there and I'd sort of teed up with the coach before I moved there that I was going to go down and, and train with her and and ultimately didn't for sort of two years. But <laughs> she, Anne Thompson's her name, she she was just really, and she just encouraged me to turn up. You know, she texted me every couple of weeks and was like, hey, like, you know, we're, we're going to meet at this time and, you know, this is the, the training dates for the next few weeks. Like, if you wanted to come along and, you know, ultimately I never did. I just sort of, <laughs> like, yeah, whatever, okay. Know, I've got I've got a boat race that day or something, but yeah, it was it not was, rowing. You went into no, rowing. No, <laughs> no, no uni boat race. Um, yeah, so so that was that was. I think that was really important for me to kind of get that time out of the sport and sort of realize yeah realize what my life could be like without it. And then ultimately, you know, I was coming to the end of my degree and and sort of decided that I wasn't ready to to kind of commit to that next part of my life. I still had the sense that I was really young and and had a lot I wanted to achieve. Uh, without getting a real job so to speak um and so yeah so that was that was when i started taking it a little bit more seriously again um i jumped 217 in my first year back and that um that qualified so i was still in palmy at that time um and that qualified me for the world uni games yeah which is a really good formative competition for track and field because it's it's multi-sport games Mm -hmm. um it's it's been smoked by covid a wee bit unfortunately and they can't haven't really got it going again um, properly so unfortunately sort of the athletes of of these days haven't quite experienced it to the level we did but um, yeah for me in 2017 that was it was in Taipei the the village was was made for the games it was right. kind of the biggest um, yeah it was it was the biggest multi-sport games that Taipei had ever um, held so they they really put a lot of resource behind it and so you go in there and it's just like a mini Olympics mm. uh, and so I think for me that was a real eye-opening experience that um, again you know I, I didn't make the final um, I jumped 210 in the comp and, and just narrowly missed the final but again looked at some of these guys who I'd only ever seen on on TV or you know on YouTube and and doing what they do like online uh, and kind of realized that I wasn't that much different from them. Mm. I was just like real undeveloped, underdeveloped. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thankfully, yeah, there was a good kind of coaching staff uh, there. There was a coach by the name of Terry Lomax, who is based down here in Christchurch and a physio um, by the name of Tamsin Chittick. And they were both there, both, you know, work quite closely together down here in Christchurch. And, and I sort of, yeah, I worked with them for a few weeks and sort of the the pre-camp and then in moving into the comp and, and after the comp, I sort of sat down with both of them individually and, and went, look, like, I'm thinking that potentially I want to just kind of put my life on hold and, and, you know, do athletics for a few years. What do you think? Like, is, you know, where do I need to get to? Mm-hmm. What gaps do you guys see having having seen me for, you know, for a few, you know, a few weeks, just, just sort of sitting back and... and um, really observing and yeah I got some really good feedback from them <laughs> Terry one of the first things he said was that he was surprised at how high I could jump given how bad my physical shape was <laughs> which which I think was 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 great because for me like that was the sense I got I I felt like I I could give so much more and yet yeah um, you know we're in this this such a small place that I'd always been praised for how good I was mm-hmm. rather than how could I how good I could have been. Yeah. Um, and he had actually done a lot of coaching overseas and, and coached some guys to sort of high 20s, high 220s. So so he could kind of see that, that I did have something and, and I definitely wasn't developed as, as well as I could have. And so, yeah, he, he said a few other things that I, I won't repeat, but um, <laughs> that was essentially the gist of, of what he said. And, yeah. and I saw that as a real challenge. I, I saw that as something that I was like, man, like he knows what he's talking about. You know, he, he didn't just say that, but he also said, look, like this is where you could get to within 12 months, you know, mm. two years, four years if you can fix these gaps um and yeah with with the help of tamsin as well uh, from a probably from more of a physiological point of view you know where where i had uh weaknesses and and kind of imbalances and and gaps within my my power delivery i guess Mm -hmm. um yeah i made the decision to move down here to christchurch in 2018 once i'd finished my degree and and just really give it a give it a shot through to 
Tokyo. Yeah, that was that was for, sort of the first goal was was see how I could do. Um, yeah, the first first winter down here, twenty eighteen. Pretty much the main goal was just to train six days a week. That was the only goal we had. It was it was about each month. I was only allowed to miss two trainings, um, and everything else had to be had to just be consistent because that was something that I just hadn't had a level of up till then. Was just oh, that yeah. that level of training consistency and, yeah. and just just being able to stack trainings and and you know I think I think my great strength as a as a young athlete was that I was able to generate a lot of power. Uh, but unfortunately, generating a lot of power when you when you haven't got you know tendon load to the place you need it to be when your your bones are still growing and mm-hmm. you know it, it caused a lot of a lot of sort of growing pains and issues. So yeah, it was all around just trying to bring my level of physicality up to actually match my my power delivery. Mm. Uh, and off the end of that, pretty much straight away, jumped two twenty four. Far out, that's so, a big increase. Big increase, yeah, big increase. I mean, yeah, there was there was a couple. By the time I moved here, so the end of that season that I was in Palm, I actually jumped two twenty one. Oh yeah, in my last comp before I moved to Christchurch. So we were, yeah, we were, we were already sort of building towards that um, before I moved here, and, and definitely saw the potential to to keep going. But yeah, um, that was that was probably the first year, and then and then twenty nineteen came around in June. I jumped two thirty uh, at Oceania oh, yeah. Champs, which yeah, to this day was probably one of the most complete jumps I'd done given the circumstances that I were in. Mm. You know, I, I think that I didn't jump 30 again for about three years. Fair um, right. And so, you know, that was a real spike performance. But, you know, as a as a young athlete, you just think that's the norm, right? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You know, you do it once and you're like, oh, it's easy. Yeah. I'm just going to do this every comp. And, and so, you're seeing this uh, pretty steady growth from what you're committed. Eh? You've put this, um, yeah. you made these sacrifices around your training load and you're seeing the results from it, yep. which then you catch that sort of, um, bug where you feel like, man, the more I put in, the more I'm getting here. Yeah, and and you know, and then this, you know, jumping two thirty is is kind of a bit of a benchmark in our sport, and you know that just blows the doors open, and suddenly, you know, I'm I'm lining up a diamond league in London. You know, I'm an Aussie just having done this comp, and it's like, oh, you're going to be in London, yeah, in three weeks time competing, and you know, just just the kind of the possibilities of 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 what could actually come from the sport suddenly just changes your mindset, and and you kind of realise like, oh. You know, this is this is global. This is big, but yeah. um, then ultimately, you know, go to London and and you know a couple of other comps I had over there and and got injured. Um, so it was sort of like ah, maybe it isn't as easy. As <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that was probably my first taste of of what I had. But then, but then, like I said, um, you know, twenty twenty comes around, sort of starting to to jump quite well domestically and and starting to sort of plan that year and what that looks like moving into the Olympics, which was something that I hadn't properly qualified for um we've kind of got an automatic entry system and then a ranking system that that we kind of use um like as a collective to to fill the full field um Mm. and i was sitting in that ranking um i was i was just in uh, and so there was sort of a decent chance that i would have been able to be selected but then also you know with new zealand selections you never quite know until it happens whether whether you're going or not and so you know there was sort of the sense of of knowing that that it could be on, uh, but then ultimately it just going up in smoke with with COVID and mm. and lockdowns and stuff and and yeah, I suppose that year as well was was probably important for me as well because I think as I mentioned I was I was injured in London and in World Champs in 2019 and there were you know a few things that I'd probably progressed you know further than what I was actually physically capable of doing and and I think that 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 time between you know 2020 and start of 2021 was was probably a really good consolidation for me around i suppose challenging a few beliefs i had i had this belief that i could never jump high in new zealand oh, yeah. just because um yeah just various reasons the the fact that i was generally the only one in the competition um for most of us and 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 also just the conditions we have here um we love the heat you know we're power athletes yeah you know 30 degrees or hotter is, is pretty optimal for us so you know, to be trying to trying to jump high in, in Wellington or or Dunedin, <laughs> got the wind as well. <laughs> At the best of times, is is yeah. I don't want to say suboptimal, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. It was a belief that I had, and then so that was something I really had to challenge. And um, yeah, ultimately, started twenty twenty one. I jumped two thirty one, which was an outright PB and outright national record. So cool. yeah, I guess yeah, first time I jumped thirty as well since since twenty nineteen. So. Yeah, I think that that gave me a lot of perspective, and and then ultimately set me up for the games. Mm. So, what was your financial commitment you had to make through that that time? Obviously, you're not working, or are you working? You're having to work on the side. How's it work? Yeah. Oh, look. 
it's it's always tough. Like you kind of look back on it and you don't quite know how you did it. <laughs> I think it's it's sort of one of those ones. You're like, wow. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I'm I'm lucky. I come from a you know, I, yeah. I I can't I can't sit here and say it was it was as tough as it is for some people. I mm. come from a good family. Um, you know, my, my dad's a doctor and my mum's a speech therapist, and you know, we we had this this amazing support network as as kids that that our parents really encouraged us to to just do something and do it really well. Um, and and I was really lucky that they they did help us out with that. Yeah. And so you know, I can't sit here and say that that you know I was it was all completely myself. But um, but ultimately, yeah, I think that probably for the first year, um, so the. The I guess the the agreement was when I went to uni was that um, if I finished, mum and dad would pay me back my fees. Oh yeah. Um, and then I just had to had to do the rest if I finished and if I passed everything. Yeah. Um, and so so that was that was something that ultimately um, I achieved, and and they were going to chuck it straight back on my student loan, and I sort of negotiated that instead of that, that that sort of sidestep that into my. Uh, my expenses account and yeah. essentially just lived off that for for you know a, f- a few months and that's cool um i actually got a job as well down here uh purely for the fact that it would just support my my training and, mm. and put food on the table so we could place makers record in oh, nice. um, just selling tools just <laughs> just with the boys which was oh it was awesome like it was they were super understanding and and kind of i think probably you know to start with they kind of didn't really realize how important sport was to me just mm. because i i probably undersold it um a little bit but ultimately you know when they they started questioning you know why you're not here as much and yeah you know what's what's going on and and i sort of gave them the ultimatum of like well you know if you need to refill this role i'll i'll, I'll quit and go and do something else and they i think they sort of they saw that as a as a sign of intent of what i did want to achieve and and really you know came on board with that so so yeah so i did i was probably that first year i was working 30 hours a week and then trying to train the you know the the other ten and mm. then recover mm-hmm. for the rest of it. So it was tough, like you know, especially winters in, in Christchurch. I wouldn't see the sun a lot, yeah. um, <laughs> which which for me, you know, being a North Island boy was a bit tough. But um, yeah, yeah, that was sort of how I kind of funded that. But also, I was really lucky. Um, Athletics New Zealand saw potential in me, um, and they they helped fund you know my support team and a little bit of travel each year, and mm-hmm. just started putting that around me. So yeah, it kind of. Probably, you know, each year I got a little bit better. Um, that remuneration scaled up just a wee bit and mm. just enabled me not so much to to come away with anything, but more just to be able to travel a little bit more each year. Yeah, it's hard, um, eh? It's a big commitment for someone to... Yeah, and it's it's kind of... Our sport is... It's pretty... It's like golf in the sense of at the top, people are pretty comfortable, mm. um, but it drops off really quickly. Mm. So I think for me... Um, especially in a field event, you know, it, it differs event to event just with the marketability and, and the popularity of each each event, you know, sprints to jumps to to distance. But for, for high jump especially, like, you know, if you're not in the top ten in the world, you're you're you're, you're doing it pretty tough. Mm. So yeah, it was it was hard. Um but I think ultimately I never saw it as a job. Like I never saw it as something that I wanted to do full time and I just saw it as something that I loved doing and, you know, if someone was gonna scrape together just enough you know, pennies to actually send me overseas, then, then like stupid for them because I was just going to do it for free, right? <laughs> like, and and I think you know, obviously that that mindset changes a wee bit nowadays, but it's it's definitely, yeah, I, I was definitely grateful for the people around me and and very lucky that I was in the position I was. Yeah, man, it's cool, and you're obviously in the top ten now. You're, you're the best in the world, so top um, one, mate. <laughs> yeah, you're you're living the the good life now. You need a um, I guess you need a Netflix series on the um, high jumpers <laughs> that we have for the sprinters. That's how your markability will be uh, boosted. <laughs> yeah, that, looking under that hood would be interesting. I think <laughs> personalities we've got in the sport. <laughs> so then, talk to me about your lead up to the Olympics. Obviously, you said it was your first major event. Um, how are you feeling going into it? Yeah, so Tokyo was was weird. Like I think um, first and foremost, we hadn't been overseas for eighteen months. Um, yeah, of course. So, okay. you know, I think that that whole that whole landscape changed a lot. I think there was a lot of anxiety um, around health and and probably something I'd never really experienced before. Just being pretty happy go lucky in terms of getting sick and all yeah. the rest of it. You know, suddenly it was like oh, there's you know, this big thing overseas that that you know we were so lucky we didn't have to you know experience it uh, fully in depth down down here, but. Uh, yeah, it was weird. Like we we didn't go straight into Tokyo. We we went to um, 
we went to Australia and then and then into the US actually, which which was eye opening, um, given given their kind of attitude towards the whole <laughs> the whole situation. So, I think that was really lucky. Um, yeah, that was that was sort of a a little entry into to, to the rest of the world again. Um, and yeah, I spent sort of a month in Aussie uh, just training with with my coach, and it was actually interesting. Uh, Maddie was there with me as well, and and we um, first and foremost we were training partners, and and that was kind of how we met and, and, and sort of, you know, devel- developed a relationship. But we actually had just started dating at that point as well. Oh, so yeah. um, it was quite funny. She was supposed to spend two weeks with us. Um, you know, she, she literally was, was there as a training partner and, and then the t- between the time that that had been planned and, and and when we actually left, you know, I had to have that conversation with Terry and just be like, oh, mate, no, you know, we actually don't need three rooms. Room. Three rooms anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a little bit funny, but um, <laughs> we can save you some money. <laughs> yeah, here. yeah, exactly. Like, if you're all right with it. Then, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. So, so she was supposed to come over for two weeks, um, and then then we were supposed to go on for another two weeks uh, up to Cairns. So we're in Townsville for the first two weeks, and then Cairns for the second, um, just for some hot weather training and and just a couple of comps and stuff. And Maddie was going to fly home um, from Townsville, and we were literally at the airport in Brisbane, and New Zealand shut their borders. Uh, it was in that sort of small period where they opened them just for a little bit, yeah. and they shut them again, and and so she she was literally at the airport. She'd just checked into her or her New Zealand flight, and the flight got like, cancelled. Or she she was sort of connecting through Sydney, and so she she was able to get to Sydney, but then Sydney to Christchurch was was gone. So All right. she, you know. <laughs> This this is this is what's great about you know being adaptable and, and you know just just having a good relationship with someone. But yeah, we us kind of just like look, just just come to Cairns, mm. like it'll be all good. And so she just literally went up to the gate and was just offloaded her bags, was just like I'm actually not going on this flight anymore. Rebooked one, um, you know, up to up to where we were going. At this point, Terry was like already through security and like gone because <laughs> he was just like you know, I'm I'm just going to Cairns. <laughs> and so like you know we're sitting there going like what do we do? And so she came up to Cairns, and and that was you know the first time that we kind of only you know spent that much time together. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So it was like you know we weren't living together. You know we saw each other training, and obviously we're developing a relationship. And you know that was obviously you know taking the the place it was. But yeah, that was those two weeks. Terry, our coach, was staying off site. I was supposed to be staying in this place by myself, and yeah. then suddenly Maddie's in there as well. Um, and it turned out that she stayed the whole time um, just because she couldn't get home and, you know, she was calling in New Zealand every day and, and trying to trying to get back. But, yeah, ultimately got a flight literally like two hours before we did to, to the US, which was lucky. But, yeah, there, there was sort of a, a funny one. You know, I'm, I'm prepping for the biggest comp of my life, but, you know, we're actually just trying to sort out our lives and see if we <laughs> like each other yeah, and can yeah. actually, you know, spend that much amount of time together. And, you know, thankfully by the end of it, we, you know, we were still talking and, Still enjoyed each other's company, so and still together now. Still together now, yeah. So, so that was quite cool because I think I look back on that time, and you know, it was hugely stressful, and and I think that there were there were points in time where my preparation didn't go the way I wanted to. Um, I did a competition in Cairns, my last comp before the Olympics, and no heighted, oh, uh, yeah. which is which is you know that's what it sounds. It's not ideal. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, when you what don't even. So I didn't even register land a height. jump. Yeah, so so I started at two. I think I started at two ten. Yeah, um, which is is nothing to write home about yeah. in terms of like the global context. Um, and so yeah, didn't even clear two ten. So there was a lot of stress going on. Um, but I also look back on that time and and I think there was also some really cool things happening in my life. Um, and I think it just reminded me just about the context of, of where I was at and, and, and kind of what, what the Olympics and, and all these big comps do to us. And so it's, yeah, it was it was really nice to have that. Um, and then ultimately I went to the US and, and caught up with Tom Walsh and his training crew. And, you know, Tom's a good mate of mine and, and you know, he's he's someone who's helped me a lot in my career and, yeah, was able to spend another couple of weeks with them and, and sort of, you know, key in and fully reset and then, mm. and then obviously going to the Games was just a weird you know it was a weird situation there was there was so much um yeah i suppose anxiety around what that looked like and we had to do three tests um covid tests going in um and if you failed any one of those for whatever reason um that was kind of the game's over for you so really yeah and so there were there was a situation uh, or a few situations with athletes who who developed false false positives um and and you know the 
the kind of the requirements that then they had to to get through to end up competing or not competing in some of their cases was was pretty rigorous and so yeah you just really got the sense of of how many uncontrollables there were around you mm. um and how kind of intensely you know focused on those controllables like hygiene and mask use and and just limiting contact was it was just really f- front and center of our minds and so yeah it was a weird situation and then you go into the games village which is which is ultimately a bit of a bit of a circus uh, <laughs> at times and 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 yeah just try and soak that that kind of that whole situation in as much as possible before competing yeah so you obviously didn't get covid no no i didn't uh which was super nice and i think it was actually really interesting as well because because we got ultimately we because of all this testing we got to the games and at that point tokyo was actually having a big outbreak and yeah. so initially it was kind of like there was this I, I suppose the residents of Tokyo weren't super stoked that their games were coming, given that you know there was going to be people from literally all four corners of the world, world, you know, converging into Tokyo, and and they saw that as as something that could bring a lot of illness. Um, but ultimately, we all got there, and actually, we didn't want to go out because they all had it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I think, yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, there was uh, there was something like five positive tests or something from the whole games, yeah, um, from the village, and I think all of us, all of them were from like locals who were volunteering coming in each day. Oh, so. Yeah. Yeah, so it was actually it was actually super fine and and yeah, probably something that you know I talk a lot about it, but I, I wouldn't say we were really obsessed about it once we were there. Um, it was just very unique, yeah, and, and just very interesting. And I think for me, being a fresh faced, you know, athlete who hadn't been to a games before, it was it was just kind of all part of the fun. Yeah, uh, but I think for some of the others, especially the you know the guys who it was going to be their last one or they sort of they were holding on to twenty twenty. And then had to push on for another year. It was it was a pretty traumatic time, and yeah, I definitely look back on it personally. Um, yeah, with with mixed emotions, but definitely a lot of fondness in just in terms of what it's done for my career. But yeah. I can see how people would see it differently. Mate, it was a crazy time. It was a crazy time in the world, eh? That the whole COVID period. But leading into your event, um, you just no jump. How how much anxiety have you got around no jumping in an Olympics? Yeah, I I think it's a funny one like. I guess part of me, no matter how well I'm doing, always dreads that first jump. Oh yeah, um, and so I think I think that that's yeah. It was probably heightened a wee bit, um, but also sometimes having that that ultimate failure or you know perceived ultimate failure can actually be really freeing. Mm. Um, and it actually one of the one of the, the the bits of gold that came from that that failure was I had a chat to Tamsin, um, my physio, who's you know who I met in, in Taipei and, and still work with to this day. Uh, and one of those chats, you know, sh- she challenges me deeply in a lot of things and, and I'm really grateful for that. And and I sort of was sitting there because she was in the US at the time um, and I was sitting there after one training and I was like, I was like, I just don't want to know height again. Um, and I know it's not right, but for me that feels like the ultimate failure. Mm. And so she sort of challenged me on that because I knew she would. And I was like, oh, like you know, th- that's just the worst thing that could happen. And she's like, do you think it's the worst thing that could happen? And I was like, mm, yeah, I do. <laughs> I was like, and she's like, well, it's not. Um, you know, for you, Hamish, and knowing you and your values and, and, and just working with you, you're, you're going to be more disappointed if you go there and you don't give it your all and you don't give it 100% effort. If you know height, so be it. But if you give it 100% effort, then, then there's, there's nothing else you can do about it. If you yeah, if you know height and you don't give it hundred percent effort, that's when you're going to be mm. really gutted. And so I suppose that that was you know quite cool to hear and just remind me um, that you know all those those sort of things that do go into those games and and how it kind of revolves and and changes and moves just as as the events kind of progress. Ultimately, if I'm just giving my effort, then then there's nothing I can really do about it. Mm. So yeah, I think there was anxiety um, around those first few jumps and, and whether I would, it was really funny actually, I remember this just always thinking like, oh, if I know height, does that mean I'm like not an Olympian? <laughs> <laughs> do, you have to, do you have to jump one to Because like, I mean, technically like, and so, yeah, so I think I ju- like genuinely, I remember doing like the first height and just clearing it. And like, okay, that's good. Like, and, and I think today, like even to this day, like that is, there is something in that. Yeah. Um, I think that we've probably challenged it a little bit in the last year or so. And that's, that's, you know, something we can talk about and, and sort of what's probably changed a little bit. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think up at all probably even, yeah, a small part of me now, it's like 
can you remember how to jump? Like, you know, it is something we do so often, but but when you really get put in that pressure cocker, can you can you deliver? Yeah. Man, so can you put the first height at any height or like is there a limit? Could you just put a really, really low one just to sort of get over your you, Yeah, you could. Like so well, yes and no. Um <laughs> a low height. Uh <laughs> one metre. <laughs> No. <laughs> so yeah, pretty much they will they'll publish the increments. And so generally those increments are sort of they go up in about four centimetre increments. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um and so it's essentially rounds. So like everyone does has three attempts at each round. You can pass a round. Yeah. Um and you can even pass like if you have one miss, you can pass the final bit of the round and then try the next round and then ultimately if you have three misses in a row then you're out. Mm. Um, so yeah, you could pass or you could like elect to start at the world record if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but it would just mean that you'd probably get three misses and then your name <laughs> would be right at the bottom cause, cause you haven't cleared a height. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, you can't just start as low as you want generally in a big competition. Um, so at the Olympics, the starting height was 217. Yeah. And you'd always start at the lowest possible. You would not anymore. No. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, Definitely, definitely for the, the bulk of my career, I've been. I'd probably just start when it starts. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, yeah, anything from from probably about two eighteen to two twenty two would be what I start at. Oh, yeah. So if there's sometimes you'll have like a lower height, especially at uh, smaller competitions. So there might be like a, a two hundred five or a two ten or a two fourteen. Yeah. Or something, and I'll generally skip that height. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is is just energy conservation mm. uh, for us. You know, there's only so many jumps that that we can actually put our body through uh and so you know it's it's a matter of making sure that those those best jumps that you've got in your legs are coming out at the highest heights mm. because unfortunately it doesn't matter how high you clear the first height um it just matters how much you clear the last height yeah man that's interesting so how many jumps would you say is the most until you start feeling that fatigue um depends what kind of phase of training i'm in or what time of the year but at an olympic games at olympic games um I'd probably say like jump ten. Oh yeah, would be when I'm looking at trying to really send it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably earlier in the year when I'm in heavy training, it might be like five to eight mm. jumps where I feel like I'm really optimum. Um, and then in Paris, I did fifteen jumps. Yeah, I was um, gonna say. So that was a lot. That's that's probably the most jumps that I've ever done in a competition. Really. And you've got to remember as well like the higher you jump the more taxing it is on your body. Yeah. And so I almost see it as like bands of of jumps. Like you can do. For me personally, like I probably do. I don't know, 15, 20 jumps at 2.15 to 2.20. Yeah. No dramas. Um, probably, you know, 2.20 to about 2.28. That's that's another kind of band where it, you probably can't do quite as many and, and you'll be feeling it the next day. And then yeah. anything over about 2.33, 2.34, if I'm having a number of attempts at, at jumps like that, then then I'm going to feel it the next day for sure. Man, that's interesting. Do you count the jumps where you go under? Where you don't quite. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> uh, you don't count the jumps. I mean, ultimately, like yeah. I think, I think that you know those are metrics that we talk about, and and it's it's definitely something that the coach is aware of, and and he's trying to sort of calculate that. But for me, like I'm. Yeah, just in the moment, I'm. I'm not worried about how many. I'm not. I'm not thinking. Yeah, you know, going oh. into a two thirty six, like, oh, this, this is eleventh jump. This is eleventh jump. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not optimum <laughs> anymore. It's, yeah, it, it, it doesn't come. Yeah, you just jump it. Yeah. So that one, you made. You made the final in Tokyo, didn't you? Yeah. And that was pretty much your goal. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think for me, I wanted to go there, enjoy it, uh, and just soak it all in. I wanted to feel like I belonged there. Yeah. Um, that was sort of one of my big things. Was was how do I enjoy that that moment and. And kind of walk into that stadium and, and just feel a sense of connection and and I did that. Um, I loved it. I I got the sense that you know each jump I wanted to do, I earned the right to. Or each jump I I cleared or didn't clear, it just earned me the right to to do another one mm. uh, until until I had three misses. And so yeah, that was definitely the mentality I had. I saw it as a as a massive uh, a massive achievement for me. I came tenth in the final, jumped two thirty, which was. The, it was pretty much the highest that anyone's ever jumped to come tenth at the Olympics. Oh yeah, um, it was it was a pretty crazy final. Uh, the the world lead going into the final was about two thirty three, um, and so everyone kind of knew if you could get a low thirty, you might be there or thereabouts. Sure. Um, and then uh, one of the Aussie boys who came fifth in the final jumped two thirty five. Oh wow! And so you know there were there were five 
or there was, I think it was about seven guys who jumped higher than their world lead mm. in that final alone. And so, yeah, so it was pretty crazy. So for me, I suppose, like, you know, stepping back from that, I went, well, you know, I just jumped 230, which was a height that I hadn't done a huge amount of times in my career at that point. Um, I'd, I'd competed. I'd, I'd sort of, you know, been able to put a string of jumps together and, and feel like I got my rhythm going. And I think at that time as well, I was, I was ranked about 21st in the world. So to come 10th was, was good. Mm. I was really happy with that. But, yeah, I think... I think ultimately, you know, you fast forward into where I am today. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of proved again to me that, that I was on the right track. Yeah. So then what's your what's your pathway for that next? Are you blocking out a four-year four, four year cycle or are you thinking Commonwealth, two years? What's your planning like post that? Yeah, well, then there was only three years. Um, oh, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I suppose, and, I, and the thing is as well is that so generally we will – I suppose our four-year cycle is world world outdoor champs on odd years, mm. so 2019, 21, 23, um, et cetera. Those are always world champs. Uh, world indoor champs is uh, usually even years, and then Com Games is the other even year. Yeah. So you go, you go like world indoors Olympics, and then you go world outdoors, world indoors Com Games, world outdoors. World Indoors Olympics. Mm. Is there much so, of a difference for indoor to outdoor as a high jumper? Uh, yes. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's more around the crowd and the the vibe that you get from them and just the energy. Oh, yeah. Um, so indoors. More, yeah, indoors, yeah, just yeah. because it's 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 Compact. enclosed yeah, yeah. And, and it's louder and stuff. But, yeah, ultimately what happened with COVID was that because we had to cancel a lot of the stuff, those, those three years were actually just real hectic. Um, we had, yeah, we had 20... 22 um so it was first year after the olympics we had a what did we have we had a world indoors we had a world outdoors and a con games and so and then 2023 we had um uh, another world outdoors uh and then this year we've had another world indoors and so it's and then next year we have another world indoors again so it's like mm. i suppose like that three year um period from tokyo to paris felt very short because ultimately we had big comps every year yeah um and so i suppose that's the next challenge now is that we are back into that four-year cycle and and there are you know they are almost back in phase with what they should be doing um yeah you kind of look at what comps coming up and it it seems a lot longer (laughs) (laughs) and going into a commonwealth games is that is the level of competition right up there or were you confident going into that commonwealth honestly Honestly, no. Like, I think, um, yeah, event to event, there's it, it, it's very dependent on what countries are there and what countries are dominant. Yeah. Uh, for sprints, it's still big. Jamaica, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Trinidad yeah. and Tobago, uh, the UK, they're always really strong. Um, distance running, you've still got Kenya. Mm. So I think for those guys, it's it's still, you know, it's still a really high-class qual- competition. Um, but for us, ultimately, it comes down to if there's any good Aussie jumpers, Kiwi jumpers, UK jumpers, or... Uh, Canadians mm. uh, and and we are such a diverse sport and and you know well event and high jump um, that just in the last couple of years it's happened that there's only been like a couple of couple of Aussies me um, like one Canadian guy and then a couple of Brits so yeah, yeah. so it wasn't it going so that was that was actually a unique situation as well we had world champs three weeks before. Um, so that was in that was in the UK uh, the US uh, so competed there. Jumped two twenty five, uh, didn't make the final. That was seen as as a, you know as a failure, as yeah. a as, as something that we need to build on. Uh, and then and then three weeks later, uh, went to Com Games, jumped two twenty five, won the Com. <laughs> and so and and then that's seen as a huge success, right? Yeah. And yeah so yeah. I th- I think that that you know going into probably last year, and, and we can talk about what happened last year uh, a little bit more, uh, but it's yeah, I th- I think it kind of masked a little a little bit of of what was going on. Um, mm. I think that I had kind of plateaued. I hadn't jumped a lot higher than than I had in the lead up to to Tokyo. But yeah, unfortunately, I think if we hadn't had that Com Games, well, you know, fortunately we had the Com Games. Obviously, I won and and, yeah. and had an amazing experience and, and did that. But I think that we probably would have impressed on the fact that that hadn't made the, the final. Yeah, a bit more than the fact that then we impressed on the fact that it had actually been good enough to win a. a, a you know, a, a global competition. So yeah, it's an interesting situation, and I think that that's what's great about our sport is that, 
you can always compare yourself with with where you're at um you know just in terms of the heights you're clearing um yeah but at the same time i think that sometimes that success does mask a a few things that are that are happening deeper down yeah definitely and like from all accounts you were like a real consistent 225 type jumper for potentially that whole year or couple of years there and then something changed where you felt like um you wanted to be a bit better than that and peak for bigger jumps yeah 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 i i guess like you know that was 2022 and then going into 2023 um yeah similar similar thing happened i I've sort of tried to push it out of my mind, so I'm trying to <laughs> what, what jumps. You've deleted I all these memories. <laughs> yeah, like look, I mean that was that was always the the thing was that I was I was you know I could jump two twenty four any day of the week. Um, yeah. I think if you like if you look at my like results like on my ranking profile, like I think I've I've finished a comp. Like there's probably a hundred results on that on that sheet, and I probably finished twenty five comps in two twenty four. <laughs> like it's just like that's just like my height, which is like. It just kills me, um, and and yeah, I think I think last year um, it was was it was very similar. Uh, I I jumped okay uh, domestically. I I probably jumped high twenties a few times domestically, and then and then went over to Europe and and kind of leading into we had a World Champs last year as well uh, into Budapest. I I was very consistent at that that mid twenties, and I think. I think we kind of saw that as as a place that I've been in before that I've been able to kind of springboard into those thirties, mm. um, but ultimately it didn't happen uh, at at World Champs and and I jumped two twenty two actually at World Champs and and came you know twentieth and I think that that um, that kind of really made me think about you know what I was doing in the sport and and kind of what, where my future lay uh, within the event and I I got this real sense that. I was sort of turning into a wee bit of a journeyman, um, and yeah. and that wasn't something that I really wanted. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the guy who could jump two twenty four any day of the week. Yeah, um, you know. And last year, I won my first ever Diamond League competition uh, in Stockholm. It was pissing down with rain, jumped two twenty four, <laughs> um, and was you know just happened to jump jump better than everyone else and, and that was the lowest height that had won a diamond league ever uh, yeah. uh, and then went to Silesia which was in Poland uh, and it was you know 33 degrees literally the next week jumped 224 <laughs> and so it's like you know for and me and got what 10 oh <laughs> yeah oh, genuinely like I think I came 8th yeah. um, and like I just didn't want to be that guy like that yeah. was that was the thing was I just I just got the sense of like I was kind of waiting for everyone else to fail mm. and that was when I was going to pounce um, I I I, I had this uh, nickname, and you know I still do to this day, unfortunately. But it's, <laughs> my nickname is Rainy Man, um, and so it's like everyone knows when it starts raining, Hamish is going to turn up. And like, yeah, I guess I guess like I like I love that. I think I think that kind of is credit to us as Kiwis. You know, we we do jump in the rain a lot. We we have to train outside and and less than ideal conditions sometimes. And yeah. so you know when that happens overseas, like like I really relish that. Um, but at the same time, like I think that, to me, I took that personally. Like I, I saw that as like the respect for me as like a, a really top level high jumper, which just mm-hmm. wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I took that on board, and and I, I came back, and and you know I had some some honest chats with my team, and and we, we sort of went back to the drawing board around you know how can we be dangerous, and how can we go out there, and and you know I still have the respect for those those competitors, and and and. You know, a lot of them are my good friends, and, and I, you know, I love spending time with them. But how can I go out there and and have them, kind of, be watching me on a sunny day, yeah, rather than watching me just when the rain comes out? <laughs> and so that's that's been a big mindset shift for me. Is is how can we just be the best in the world all the time, and and not wait for them to to mess up, but actually expect them to to be at their top level. Mm. Um, that was just a big thing for me. Is that in the past, like you know, when when the big dogs came out to play, I just like I just couldn't find that next gear, mm. um, and so yeah, it's it's been it's been a big mindset shift. It's it's been tough at times. Um, I think there's there's a there's a level of expectation, uh, personal expectation, and then also expectation within the team around my conduct conduct that we've we've really had to raise this year. But ultimately, I mean, it means that when the bar's at two thirty six, and you know, it's all to play for. Yeah. That's that's the the moments that I'm I'm relishing and and I think that I've been able to make that mindset shift really nicely, and so it's about you know how can we push on now? Was that around the time you've you changed coach? Because I 
I know you changed coach about twelve months ago. It was, yeah, yeah, and that that was that was part of that that process. Yeah, I suppose. Um, you know, me me and Terry had worked closely together for for about six years at that point, mm. and um, you know, he he got me to where I was at. You know, I, I jumped two thirty three uh, under under Terry, and you know, I I'm immensely grateful for for all the work he he gave me. But I think ultimately, you know, the probably the the gaps that we saw were slightly different. Um, I think that he still saw technical and physical gaps. I probably saw process and mental gaps yeah. um, just in terms of how the team works and, and how I really um, kind of buy into the process, I suppose. And so, yeah, so we, we sort of sh- shuffled that role around a little bit. Um, he was actually looking at retiring as well at that time and, and you know, he's still going through that process at the moment. But, um, yeah, it, it was just a, a good time to do it. Uh, I think that it was probably a little bit bold doing it before the Olympics. Yeah. Um, we'd sort of already talked before that that um, process formally happened about the Olympics probably being one of his last comps, mm. um, and so I sort of just brought that that timeline forward as I as I sort of realised that it was probably going to be, you know, the the best option for me um, moving into twenty twenty four, and so yeah, brought on a new coach, um, a very different role though. It wasn't kind of a like for like change. Like I think that. Um, Jimmy, my new coach, he brings a lot of communication and a lot of connectedness to to the rest of the people in the team, and, and being able to kind of enable them to to really flourish and do their jobs as well as they they want to and and, and feel feel they can. Um, and you know those other jobs being nutrition and, and biomech and physio and strength conditioning and, and all the other things that make up a great team. And mm-hmm. so yeah, so he he was really kind of like an enabler um, and. And also, I have a, a very strong personal connection to Jimmy. Um, you know, he's actually one of my best mates. I, I lived with him for two years when I moved oh, down yeah. here, and um, and you know, we came through the sport together. He's he's three days older than me, which which definitely shows. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, so I suppose it was a very different role that he he came into. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I think it was the role that was really appropriate for me at that time. Yeah. What's your working relationship? Obviously, similar age. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good mates. How, how how do you make that work? It's. It's I I love it. Like yeah. I think I think that um, I'd always really respected him as a coach. So so he was a hurdler. So he was a really good age group hurdler. Um, and and I was he was also a high jumper as well. And so that's kind of how I knew of him. Um, I would say we were close back in the day. He was a Tamaru boy. I was a Jaffa. So you know <laughs> it was probably a little bit of separation there. But um, he yeah he was also way better than me. Like he was like he was the man. Like he went to World Juniors and oh, yeah. and just you know did all this age group, age group stuff. And unfortunately for him, just didn't quite ever grow into his his full frame. So yeah. um, you know which a lot of a lot of Kiwi kids <laughs> have problems with. So yeah, so he he kind of moved more into the strength conditioning space and and got a got a role with uh, high performance sport New Zealand. This was when I was actually living with him, so I was sort of a starving high jumper, and he was a starving uh, SNC. Yeah, uh, and so that was quite a cool kind of place to start. And um, I kind of always really valued his his input and and his insight into into kind of physical performance. Mm. And and I, but also at the same time, you know, it's the classic. I never go into business with your mates, um, yeah. and so I think that I never really saw that as a viable option for me because because we were so close. But I think it's different for us because we lived together for so long. Like we already kind of had that working relationship. Mm. Um, you know, we we had to work out who was going to do the, the chores each week, and and you know who's paying bills, and and you know just all that kind of you know mundane stuff that you have to do as flatmates. And so yeah. I think we already had that relationship. And yeah, it is it is uh, sensitive at times. Um, but I think yeah, probably one of the biggest things is you know if I'm sending him a WhatsApp or a text. It's, it's business, and yeah. if I'm sending him a Snapchat or an Instagram, it's, <laughs> it's, it's usually slightly more more casual. And so, yeah, I think I think that's what's cool. But at the same time, like now, like we get to travel the world together, and so like we're just like two mates, just just like lapping it up. Yeah, how good. I think that you know, there's there's times when the notebook will come out, and and we'll sort of sit down and be serious for a few minutes, and then and then we can kind of just get back to just enjoying it. Yeah. So heading to heading to the Paris Olympics together. Um, What's your mindset like? How are you feeling going into it? Are you are you touted as the favourite, or were you sort of on the on yes the ranks no. there? Like, yes and no. I think, I mean, there's just so many metrics that you can use in our yeah. sport, um, and so I suppose like it's great because you can kind of talk your way out of situations a lot, yeah. or talk your way into yeah, situations. Yeah. And if so, it's raining, yeah, hundred <laughs> um, percent. I'd won world indoors, uh, so at the start of this year I won world indoors, which was my first ever world champs uh, win. Jump two thirty six. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a. A PB for me at the time, uh, and and my first ever global win, and 
So you could see that as I was the form jumper. Mm. However, uh, the two former Olympic champions, um, so the Qatari, Mutaz Basham and Italian Gianmarco Tamberi, they both, both went there. Um, they weren't competing in that. Indoors is, you don't always get everybody um, just because because people are often focused on, on the outdoor season that sometimes, you know, training training schedules and, and just various things don't line up. So, so they went there. So I won that, but... I wasn't competing against everyone, yeah. and and then ultimately I had a string of of some some really good performances through the early Diamond League season, where I think I won about three or four of the meets um, out of five. I think I only had I only had a couple of losses this year, um, oh, yeah. so I was I was in really good form. But yeah. again, like Tambiri, I didn't compete against Tambiri until the Olympics. Um, he was just on a completely different kind of. Uh, trajectory to me this year, uh, and he ultimately jumped two thirty seven at, uh, at European Champs, which was which is a higher height cleared than what I'd done. And so I think yeah, there was definitely elements of being the favourite. I was the number one on the world rankings at that point. Oh, yeah. um, I, that sort of yeah, it was actually pretty crazy. I, I took that spot on the last comp before the Olympics, oh, yeah. and so you know having, I mean, I started the season in like seventh place or something. And then, then came into the Olympics, and I was suddenly world number one. And yeah, I, I think, I think part of part of me knew that that was something that was cool, but also that was something that I'd been stuck in in the past was like knowing I was in good form and expecting to do well. Mm-hmm. I knew that none of that mattered. Like I knew, especially with my you know my experience of the last Olympics and and how you know I know I did beforehand, and you know there was all these complicated things happening, and I was able to just put that all to bed and and actually you know create a whole new a new sort of part of my story. I knew that, yeah, anything that had happened up till the Olympics was was irrelevant at that point once I got there. And it was actually quite nice because I did get a bit of media coverage going into the Games because we were one of the only sports that was actually competing. Um, you know, a lot of other sports, they have you know, like long pre-camps and, and big holding camps and stuff, and athletics kind of don't really do that. Like, we we have we do have pre-camps and holding camps, but they're quite small. Mm-hmm. Um, we are often just out there competing up to the last minute. And so yeah. I was kind of one of the only, like, Olympians who was actually, like, winning on the global stage. And so, you know, I was getting a lot of, you know, calls and, and people saying, oh, what's going on? Like, you know, tell us about your prospects and stuff. But then since I was at the last, I was one of the last uh, athletes to compete at the Games, all of that just dried up once the game started. Mm. And so I still had like two weeks, but the games was on, so I'd, no one was contacting me. Sure. It was just amazing. <laughs> it was so good because it was like I could do all that and not feel super connected to you know the whole situation. I wasn't in Paris or I wasn't even in France at the time yeah. um, that the game started. And so I was able to kind of you know field a lot of that stuff and, and just kind of soak that all in and then and then really just start keying into to, to what that looked like. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, like for me, my mindset was is that Qualifying has always been a, a tough thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I didn't make. I've, I mean, I've never made a world champs final. Um, I've always kind of gone out in the the three that I've done. I've I've failed to make the final, and so so for me, I was very focused on that. Um, I was very focused on kind of how I deal with the the stress and the pressure of of just the wider situation. And yeah, I don't think that being world number one really played into that. Mm. So you you landed your first jump. <laughs> yeah. <didn't you? laughs> Olympian, <laughs> <laughs> and then when you got to was it two twenty one from memory, um, failed yeah. twice, and then yeah, it's all down to yep. one moment where you might not even qualify. Talk me through that whole scenario and what's going on in your head there. Yeah, I'm still exhausted thinking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. Like I think that um, yeah, like you said, jumped. Jumped well uh, in the opening stages of the competition and through warm up, I knew that I wasn't fully connecting. Like I knew that I I wasn't kind of at optimum, mm. um, and a lot of that comes down to mindset and and kind of just dealing with the nerves. Um, but it just it just didn't feel right. Like I think I just well I, I know that I, I just wasn't trusting my my kind of I suppose wasn't trusting my technique and my rhythm and timing uh, that we'd built so well over the the season. Um, and yeah, got to that two twenty jump. Uh, first one was just a bad jump. Like you know, those things happened. I I hurried through my my run up. If you you know, if high jump's so rhythm based that you kind of can't really push harder. Like mm. you just have to push in a zone. Uh, and so so in, in hurrying through and trying to just get the jump done, 
it was almost like I just wanted to get out of there as quick, quickly as possible. Yeah. So I was just trying to jump as fast as possible, and, and that just is not good for me. Um, yeah, bad jump. First one was a bit hurried. Second one, um, yeah, it was it was just terror. Like I, I genuinely just like my legs buckled midway through my run up because I was just so nervous. Like I just had jelly legs. Um, you know, you think about, you know, the, the times you have to go up and, you know, speak in front of people and you you know, your legs are shaking. Like I was dealing with that mid run up. Um, and yeah, I kind of sat there and there was sort of this, you know, this felt like eternity between that second and third jump. And, um, I'd pretty much already started crying. Like it was literally like for me, I think the PTSD of what had happened and, and all the other kind of world champs where I failed to make the final, um, none of them was going to be as bad as that one. Like mm. jumping, you know, failing to jump 220 in like a global competition where you've jumped 236 that year is, is just like, yeah, it's it's not good. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, I was sort of sitting there just thinking like maybe I just don't have it. Like maybe, maybe you know, I can be the best guy in the world and yet when the pressure truly, truly comes on, I'm just not good for it. Like, and you know that I was sitting there thinking that and, and I was, I was actually really lucky. Like I, I obviously was able to pull myself out of that and, and start, you know, doing my breath work and visualization and just trying to, you know, disconnect myself from that outcome Mm. and start thinking about process again. But I also, I couldn't have just done it purely by myself um i was really lucky uh one of my my best mates through high jump uh tobias pochier he's a, a german guy he was sitting next to me um because we you know we sit in these bleachers and, mm. and just sit there and watch the comp go by and and last year he he made the final in budapest where i bombed out and we were sitting together in the qualifying and yeah. so it was sort of like this like i wanted to be there and support him and 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 but i was also you know real gutted and he actually no hided it um at Paris, unfortunately, but he was sitting there um, being like, bro, like, you know, like, you've got this, like, you can do it, and and kind of almost gave me a few insights as to what he was seeing. Yeah. Um, you know, he was like, look, like, there are some guys out there who are trying to get in your head because they know that, you know, you've got a, you've got a tiger on your back now, mm-hmm. like, and I don't think you realise, but, like, they're getting, they're getting under your skin. With what sort of stuff? Well, uh, one of the big things was um, in warm-up, uh, one of the athletes who is one of the four medalists, um, mm. was every time I went to do a more jump, he just happened to appear in front of me. Oh, yeah. You know, he was fiddling with his mark, he was moving around. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd never really experienced that before. Uh, and I just was just getting pissed off because I was like, oh, like, get out of the way. Like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, and, yeah. And, then, and then Toby, like, you know, between that second and third jump was like, you realise, like, like, he's scared of you. Mm-hmm. And that kind of just like switched a flip, uh, like you know, flipped flipped switch for me. And yeah. I, I was kind of like, shit. Like that was when I probably saw myself as a true contender. Was when one of the former medalists was trying to mess with me. I was like, he's not trying to mess with anyone else. He's trying to mess with me. Like he's scared of me. Mm-hmm. He's he's a, like he's an Olympic medalist. Yeah, I'm in my mind and nobody because like I hadn't done it on the biggest stage yeah. and yet he's scared. And so I think that that really kind of kicked me into gear. Um, again, I went over to Jimmy, my coach and, you know, I just put all my trust in him and was like, you know, like, oh, can I do this? And he's like, yeah, of course you can. Like you can do this. And and so, yeah, ultimately was able to put a good enough jump together. It mm. still wasn't pretty. Did you still feel the jelly legs or the, the, not as much yeah. um, because I stopped trying to just get out of there as quickly as possible yeah. um, and, and just really realised that whether I liked it or not, I was, you know, was going to have to be there for a couple of hours. Mm. Um, and so I better sort of just like slow down, relax, um, <laughs> relax as much as possible <laughs> uh, and, and just, just go back to what works for me um, yeah. rather than just sort of try and just – speed the whole process through yeah so, how long is that gap between your second jump that you failed and that third jump that you've got to attempt i was probably about five minutes oh yeah 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 so enough time to to go through a few waves of emotion yeah <laughs> <You've> <laughs> and through it all tears <laughs> yeah 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 and and so yeah i mean i think that was the thing is ultimately i did clear that jump um but my career would have taken a very different turn if i hadn't mm. um and i think that's kind of something that 
still scares me uh, a little bit, and I think that it's it's kind of there's probably a, a wider kind of metaphor or you know life learning there is that if I hadn't got that, I probably would have had to retire. Um, I think that for me, I just don't think there's anything coming back from that. Like mm. I'd I'd ha- I'd faced these these challenges so many times, and we'd worked so hard, and I'd had the perfect year leading into it. Like it genuinely couldn't have gone better. And yet, like, it could have all been over. Mm. And yet now we're sitting here talking about what happened ultimately, you know, a couple of days later where I where I, I won. Yeah. And, you know, that just completely changes your life in a, in a completely different direction. And it's just, yeah, it's scary to think about it. But I think it's also, you know, pretty beautiful because it's like that that jump went from, you know, a split second of being I'm not good enough to being like, if I can do this despite all of that, there's nothing I can't do. Yeah. And so once I did that jump and once I cleared it, even though it wasn't a perfect jump, like the genuinely, you know, the third attempt I had in the final at 231, which if I hadn't missed that, I would have been probably sixth or seventh. Um, and then ultimately the jump off, just like it was just easy. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy how much one like one moment a eh? like one little thing that could have gone wrong and your whole career your whole life is just so different you yeah. not, might not be sitting here as an olympic champion you're yep. sitting here as an reti- as a retired high jumper which would be yeah. um, man, it was genuinely like the hardest moment of my entire life yeah. like yeah Maddie, my girlfriend Maddie, thankfully she was in the stadium uh, <laughs> Well, thankfully, I I made the mistake of looking up at her um, between the second and third attempt, and, yeah. and all my siblings were there in the stadium as well, and they were just white as sheets. Eh? Like, and they were just like <laughs> Maddie. Maddie was just like hiding, and my like sisters like yeah, just hiding behind my sister essentially. And I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> but you know, J- Jimmy was talking to Maddie afterwards, and was just like that was that was like Hamish's moment. Like mm. that was the hardest thing that he's probably ever gonna have to do. But, you know, he showed his true colours. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's cool. I mean, you know, we love training and we love, you know, the comfort of, of being in our home and, and, and just being back here in New Zealand and doing what we do. But I think that's the thing that I love for is, like, you build this framework up and you want to you want to stress test it, right? Mm. Like, what better way to do that than just absolutely throwing yourself in the cauldron? Yeah. And are you feeling the same at the 231 height like going into that third jump you wouldn't have you said you wouldn't have meddled there if you Nah, it's a bit different i think um i think there i yeah i i think in the 220 there was a sense of helplessness yeah uh, i think there was a sense of not knowing why i wasn't jumping well mm. um because i hadn't had enough jumps to really get into my rhythm and and i was hurrying and i was doing a few things that i don't usually do yeah. um and just in terms of 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 just my position and my curve and my run up and and just the way I was um, developing force, um, yeah, it was slightly different. Whereas the two thirty one, I knew that I had the height in me. Um, I knew I hadn't put it down yet, but I mm-hmm. also knew what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And so I think that was the big thing. Was like, you kind of almost gets the sense of like it's almost like trying to bring the tires to temperature. Um, and so through the competition, you use those early jumps to to kind of still set a really high standard in terms of your position and your timing and your rhythm and your technique but you're not really looking at trying to jump really really high you're just trying to jump really really well Mm. and then once you can kind of get that feeling and that sense because every track is different every competition is different whether it be you know your physical uh your physical status or you know how bouncy the the track is and that's generally to do with what surface it is or how hot it is or you know what the conditions are there's always these little things that you're trying to sort of click into gear in the mm-hmm. back of your mind and so yeah in that final like the first jumps it was it was just patience it was getting used to the track it was getting used to the surface it was getting used to the situation i mean you know it's start to france eighty thousand people it's, yeah it's loud it's 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 overwhelming at times and so yeah i think going into that final jump at, at 231 was like i haven't shown my best jump yet mm. it's just a matter of time though and so yeah i was able to thankfully really click into gear on that one and then I was able to hold that gear. That was, that was I was pretty much into sixth gear at that point. You know, I was pretty much into top gear. Mm. Uh, and then through, you know, the next jumps, I was able to thankfully just clear them first attempt because I was still in that gear and just holding that. Yeah. And then you get to the decision where you, you go to the jump off or split the gold. Yeah. And, look, I mean, it's just, it was just such a, 
such a cool moment. Um, you know, I was just so grateful to be a part of that. And it's super funny because the the, the final in Tokyo also went to a jump off um, and they of, of ultimately decided to share it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think people realise how uncommon that is. Like, it's literally unprecedented. Like, those are the two comps I've ever been a part of where it's gone to a jump off. Ever. Ever. And so, you know, in my 150, you know, 200 comps I've ever done, those are the right. only two that have gone to jump off. It's just impossibly low, the, the chances of it happening. Yeah. You have to essentially have had the same number of misses throughout the entire competition. And like I said, I've done 15 jumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the chances of me and Shelby having the exact same number of misses after that, it's just so low. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, when you're competing at the highest level and everyone else is kind of jumping around the same height you are, there's, there's a lot higher chance uh, mm. than than me kind of getting into a jump off back here in New Zealand or something. But, it, uh, yeah, it makes a big difference. That, you know, it is it is something that just – it just wasn't supposed to happen. Like, mm. it just, it's just not – it's just not high jump. Like, <laughs> usually the highest guy – you know, the guy jumps the highest and, and you just – off you go. But, yeah, it had been something that we had talked about a little bit uh, moving into it because of what had happened in Tokyo. Mm. Um, just around, you know, we – us high jumpers, we travel the world together and we love to sit there and... Oh, so you've t- spoken to the other athletes about I've, it? Yeah, I've spoken to it. Oh, yeah. Not all of them, but um, I definitely had chats of, with a few of them, um, some of my closer closer mates, um, and then also with Jimmy, my coach, and, and my girlfriend, and, you know, a few, you know, just, just mates back home and, and stuff like that. And I think that in talking to them and just kind of understanding where I, you know, what I love about the sport and what I love doing and, and kind of the way I want to conduct myself as an athlete is... Yeah, I, I think that with with all due respect to what had happened, I think that was really right. I think mm. what they did was was great, um, given the circumstances. However, I always knew that if I was in that position, I wanted to fight and I wanted to see what what would happen because yeah. I think that the the fans deserve it. I think the fans got an amazing show in the fact that they did share it because that was something that was kind of like what like yeah. is that possible? Like yeah, and, yeah. you know, there was all this debate around that, but. You know, ultimately, when that all cools off, it's yeah, it's it's just not as exciting the second time around. Mm. Um, and so, I think for me, um, I always knew before the comp, like you know, before the Olympics even happened, it was like, like, yeah, if if it had happened, which it won't, <laughs> I I wouldn't for a second share it. Um, I think for me, it would just be around just you know being able to have that show and be able to you know just yeah. prove yourself against the best in the world because the thing is at the end of the day like i said like we're athletes like we train so hard and we do all this work and we put everything into into these certain moments and then suddenly we get given what's potentially the coolest moment you'll ever get um as an athlete you know you're you're at the olympics you've got mm. you know you know a few billion people watching and you get told like you can like just you can literally drop the mic here like you can just go out there and one jump and you win everything yeah win, like win it all and i think for me like i was just like there's no way i'm not saying like i'm not saying like i'm not i'm yeah I, why would you not right? yeah I, I suppose that's the that was my kind of mindset and so yeah when i jumped that 238 uh, final attempt where i Jumped under the bar and became a meme. Um, <laughs> yeah, got off the mat, uh, walked over to Shelby, and, and he was standing there uh, with the, the official. And yeah, it was kind of like that little, like little trying to suss each other out. Kind of yeah. does <laughs> what's over. he want? <laughs> yeah, it was a little, little bit of negotiation. Like got the old marketplace. Like, <laughs> um, like how much you want, bro? Uh, so yeah, so so there was a little bit of that, but I could see that he wanted it. Yeah. Um. And and the thing is, is well, ultimately, um. You know, you have to be, you have to mutually agree to share. Yeah. And I knew I wasn't sharing. Yeah. And so for me, it was a pretty easy conversation. Yeah. And so I just said, like, do you want to jump, bro? And he's, he's like, yeah, let's go. You were content to come away with the silver to, to see, I was prepared, to make sure that you I was prepared to, yeah, I was. Yeah. I was, I was prepared to, I mean, it would have sucked. Um, mm. You know, I, I'm not sitting here saying that winning silver, you know, having been faced with the, the opportunity to share a gold would have been good. But I think that for me, for the fans, for for who I am and what I stand for, um, I wanted to find mm. out. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to to put my, you know, all the work and all the process and, and all the people who believed in me, you know, over the years, I wanted to, to put that all in the ring and mm. just, you know, put it to the ultimate test. And, yeah. and so that's what we did. And, yeah, like I said, I think that if I'd been sitting here with the silver, I, you know, I... I 
I'd be gutted. Um, there'd be parts of me that would, you know, would would be pretty sad. But at the same time, I would have been so much more stoked with that silver than knowing that there's another gold out there somewhere. Yeah, man, that's cool. And then the moment that you um, you have won, obviously a lot of questions came in about the the celebration and the iconic run into the middle of the javelin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the javelin field. Um, what what was going through your mind there once you'd won it? Yeah, so first and foremost, I knew the javelin was over. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I <laughs> could have been a disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were like, I think we were first jump. It was like the first jump of the jump off. Um, so so two thirty eight, you get one more attempt, uh, and then you go two thirty six, and then two thirty four. So two thirty four, I ultimately cleared to win. Mm. Um, so we had a couple of misses there as well. And um, so two thirty eight, I was sitting there ready for my first jump of the jump off, and the javelin girls came around for their victory lap oh yeah, yeah. And so i was like oh yes <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah i think for me like the reason behind that's that was that um you don't get that many opportunities to work a crowd like that mm. in, in athletics and that's something that we love doing we love getting the crowd involved and you know I, I love feeding off the energy and so i knew that that you know 99 percent of the time when someone wins or when you know there's an amazing event usually they run towards the crowd mm. and that actually isolates you know 60% of the rest of the crowd because mm. you've got all the people on the other side of the stadium who probably were involved in that moment and, and were clapping along and cheering but but then ultimately you're running away from them yeah um, and so so for me I'd never even seen anyone ever go right into the middle of the stadium no. and so I was just like <laughs> oh the field's open like, yeah why not yeah and so yeah I, I think that part of it was pre-planned um, so you were planning this as you were lining up jumps yeah 100% like oh, I right, was I was sort of sitting there going like you know what what am I going to do if I win <laughs> and you know what what what's what's the go like you know some guys are dancers and celebrators and that's not really me <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a runner <laughs> and so yeah so I suppose yeah there was, there was I was thinking about it yeah. um, uh, but but you know, thinking about it, and then and then coming back to what I'm actually there for, and, and yeah. trying to really connect in, and and I, I suppose like once it, yeah, once it was an option, and once I was on for that, um, it was very automatic. It was, mm. it wasn't, yeah. I mean, I I to this day I couldn't tell you how loud the crowd was. I couldn't tell you if people were cheering for me afterwards or whether they were excited, um, because yeah, I just couldn't hear anything. I was just running, just in the zone, <laughs> and it's so cool. And then what's it like post? Everyone probably has this image of what it's like being an Olympian post it, but I'd imagine it's full of drug testing and interviews. And Yeah, well, directly afterwards, um, I, I suppose one of the overarching themes or feelings that I had was relief. Uh, yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I, me and Shelby were getting tired for sure. Mm. Uh, 15 jumps is a lot for us. It's the most I've ever done in a comp, and, and I knew that if I didn't jump that 234, um, yeah, I was I was going to run out of energy real quick. Yeah, and I think there would have probably actually have to have been a conversation with him around whether we were going to keep going or whether we actually just stop. Mm. Uh, and so, so yeah, I actually moved my run up in, which I you never do. You always move out because you you get more confidence and you start moving faster oh, and wow. you start warming up. And and that was like literally the first time I've ever, um, you know, Jimmy Jimmy said to me, "It's like you're just going half foot because you're actually struggling to get there." Um, you're probably working too hard to really try and do that, and so I, I moved it in, and I went. This is like this is it. This is the one jump. Mm-hmm. I have to get this, otherwise, yeah, we're going to be here all night. And mm-hmm. so yeah, so obviously did that. So there was a lot of relief. Um, did my victory lap, um, which was was amazing. Um, it was just so cool to kind of get the, the gratitude from the crowd and 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 just sort of see what it meant to them and. Um, got to ring the bell as well which, which yeah I saw probably a few people saw it was it was one of the bells from notre dame and they're chucking it back up in the in the cathedral um as it's getting rebuilt and so yeah got to ring that but again like i was waiting for a tv slot for that and so like on, on the tv everything just kind of like moves really seamlessly but i was like waiting there for like 10 minutes <laughs> the guys like yeah, just another couple of minutes like yeah, just waiting, just waiting. I was like, hurry up man like, <laughs> And so yeah, I was able to like obviously do that, and then and then started going through media. Um, probably got about two or three interviews deep. Got pulled out of there to go to medal ceremony because it was the last night at the athletics, oh, yeah, and so yeah. they had to do all the medal ceremonies that night. Um, yeah, and so kind of got dragged through, you know, under the stadium, and I didn't have any of my medal clothes with me. Like I was just like oh, like trying to get on the phone. Like only just got my phone back from like you know post event and stuff because yeah. we don't take them out with us and. 
And so I was like trying to call these people and it's like, yeah, no, 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 it's all good. Like, yeah, no, I won. But like, where's my clothes? Like, who's got them? Like, <laughs> and like Jimmy's like running around the warm-up track, like trying to find them and, and sort of then trying to negotiate like, you know, all the security to sort of get to where I was and, and drop them in. So then, you know, I had a real special moment with him just kind of parking up as I was waiting to, to go out and get my medal. And, mm. um, and yeah, that was just super cool to kind of have a little bit of quiet. Um, I think that's one that, thing that I love and, and sort of, yeah, I think about a lot is, is that moment of of quietness when you you leave the stadium or you leave you know the infield mm. um, and you go under the under the um, the tunnel and then suddenly you know all that noise just melts away and you're sat there with your feelings and your thoughts and yeah it, it can be confronting but it also can be quite special and so yeah I was able to kind of sit there in that space with Jimmy and and we sort of chatted but also at this point I mean we're talking it's probably. It's probably nine thirty at this point. Yeah, I hadn't eaten since lunch, Shit. and so I was starting to get so hungry. Eh? <laughs> so I was sort of like trying to, trying to like you know obviously get a bit of nutrition in, but like you know it's an athletic stadium. They only got like bananas, and, <laughs> and, and I'm just wanting a burger at that point. So it's yeah, it was it was it was definitely interesting. But yeah, then medal ceremony straight back to media. Um, did probably I don't, I don't know an hour and a half or two hours of media. Then I had to go to a press conference, then drug testing, and then I finally left the stadium at 2am. Far out. Um, so, yeah, super long night. And then, joys. And then, you know, you're coordinate, coordinating with family and, and Maddie and, and, you know, like, where are you guys? Like, oh, yeah, you're going home now. Yeah, no, all good. Like, I'll just catch up with you guys there. And, like, oh, you, st- you guys still awake? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they obviously were. Like, they, you know, they were, they, were in, they were in full flourish at that point. But, um yeah, yeah, it's it's a long night. Um, kind of got to to go and see them, which was really lucky. They were staying nearby, so I just me and Jimmy and Terry actually. Um, Terry was my old coach. He was he was at the at the stadium as oh, well, cool. which was which was really special to have him there yeah. and, and kind of be able to complete that journey um, with him. And so, yeah, us three we kind of wanted to to where Maddie and my family were staying, and and I kind of just sat there in the corner and <laughs> just kind of like looked at my medal and just like what. <laughs> And like they were all just like blow by blow of like how they had to like, you know, jump the fence into a certain <laughs> section to like, you know, cheer me on and just like classic Kiwi stuff pretty much. But um no, nah, it was just so cool to have them there and just just see them buzzing out and then yeah, me and Jimmy ultimately got home probably, you know, six thirty, seven. Uh, and then, then I was up again at seven thirty just to get into it. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's busy time and, and you get tuckered, but yeah, it's just it's just all worth it, right? Man, it's so cool. It's so cool hearing it all from you because it feels like I've just gone through that whole journey <laughs> with you. It's just feeling all those emotions and what you had to go through to to achieve it. It's it's so cool to hear. And mm. I guess what's what's the next plan for you? Where to next? Yeah, well, I mean, that's you know that's the hard bit, right? Yeah. It's 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 you reach the the top of the mountain and and you're kind of looking out and you enjoy the view for for five minutes and and then, <laughs> yeah. and then you start looking around to see if there's any higher mountains and <laughs> unfortunately when you win Olympic gold the you know the there aren't too many higher mountains yeah um, there's some some much higher mountains and world records and and you know you know multiple what is the world record two forty five oh far out so much higher mountain yeah um and look it's not you know, it's it's not off the cards. It's not something that I'm saying that was never achievable for me. But I think when I think about my strengths and as an athlete, um, you know, being process and mental and being able to put a whole package together, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't think that world record really motivates me. Yeah, um, I don't think it's something that I get out of bed thinking, yeah, let's get stuck into trying to jump two forty six. Something that really excites me is is obviously jumping two forty. That's mm-hmm. a that's a next kind of really big mind, uh, you know, goal and. Um, something that would kind of not only put me in terms of a, one of the greatest ever in terms of competing and being an Olympic medalist or gold medalist, but it's it's actually who's you know one of the best high jumpers ever. Um, so that's, that's something I want to put my my name in. But um, yeah, I think the thing that excites me is is trying to jump the Olympic record. Mm. Um, I think so. That's two thirty nine, oh, yeah. um, which is quite interesting given that the world record is two forty five yeah, and, and so the Olympic record is two thirty nine. I think that. It's probably not a record that people think about a lot, um, yeah. but I guess for me, like you know, where I see me making a mark in sport and and, and my kind of legacy is is being the best guy when it mattered, mm. and I think that comes back to not wanting to be the journeyman and yeah, yeah. you know not wanting to to kind of be the guy who no one's really that worried about. I want to be dangerous when it really matters, mm. um, and so I think for me, like yeah, this next four years, 
you know, it's not solely going to be focused around that. I, we've got a couple of world outdoors, which I feel like I have a little bit of redemption uh, <laughs> yeah. that I need to go and seek with, with those and, and one of them being next year, actually. So, so okay. there's, there's definitely some stuff to keep me busy. But, yeah, I think ultimately my kind of, I think, crowning moment, um, so to speak, you know, if I, if, you know, if I can get there and, and hopefully I do is, is, yeah, jumping that Olympic record in, in uh, LA and, yeah, if that gets me, you know, a defence of a title, then, then so be it and mm-hmm. great. But also I think that in terms of a controllable, to know that of all the guys who have come before me uh, in the sport, I was the guy that jumped the highest when it really, really mattered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's something that, that I'd definitely be able to kind of sign off that part of my life and, and be really stoked with. Mate, that's so cool and exciting, eh? Exciting four years ahead for you. Um, looking forward to following it and I have gone to the Instagram I mentioned it before uh-huh. lots of them were around the um, the celebration but we did get a few other good ones we'll race through a few of these because yeah, man you have been on fire <laughs> first one is what age could you dunk oh what age could I dunk probably 16 16 oh yeah yeah, yeah. I remember trying and just getting like rejected all the time <laughs> got it good feeling Good feeling, all right. How many times a week do you train? Love your style, by the way. Oh. You've got a lot of fans of your style. Thank you, thank you. I, yeah, um, yeah. I train six times a week. Well, six days a week with a rest day, but, I yeah. mean, in our in our world, rest day is still just as important. So, yeah, yeah I'd say pretty pretty full-time. Like, we – most mornings is fully dedicated towards training. So, yeah. so whether that's, you know, two to three hours of training um, – you know, in a heavy block, and then the afternoon is all around recovery. Yeah, uh, and so and that is for me just as an important part of of the whole process. Yeah, is it mainly jumping like plyometrics type stuff, or is it? So we do roughly three. So this isn't going to add up to six. So yeah. it's kind of like hybrids of of these. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, three gym sessions a week, uh, two to three jump sessions a week, and then like two running plyo, plyo kind of bounding sessions on the track. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, nice. Nothing, no high intensity stuff. You don't have to be physically fit, like not not like aerobic stuff. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I, and I. That's why he chose high jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, like I said, like, like my history is distance running, and and I did come from that space, and so I do like on off season, love to go for a jog and yeah. get on my bike and and you know go for a few mushes and stuff. But yeah, for the most part, like it's just it's just not me. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, who was your favourite rugby player and why? Oh, favourite rugby player? Uh, probably Dougie Howlett. Oh, yeah. Going back a wee bit, showing yeah, my yeah, age. Yeah. Um, couple of reasons. Yeah, just I was a winger, loved watching his style. Um, I was also an Auckland boy, so it was cool to see him come through. And also he's a grammar boy, and yeah. that's where I went to school. So, yeah, the sort of motifs around like what he did and his legacy. He wasn't at school at the same time as me. It was, you know, a number of years before. <laughs> he was also an athlete, actually. He, he did the he did 110 hurdles. And to this day, still has the Auckland record, I think. True, uh, for, secondary, for secondary schools. So the hurdles. Yeah, so probably, probably, probably Dougie. Yeah. That's a great shout. That's a that's a good throwback. Good Dougie Howlett. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, advice for getting into high jump. This probably isn't like advice for getting into high jump, but just generally, like I think that just find something you you're just really passionate about. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, there was no um, there was no pathway in high jump and. I think that there's probably slightly more of a pathway, but it's also my pathway. Like, yeah. I don't think that that necessarily means it's everybody's pathway uh, in terms of getting into high jump specifically. I think that that's one of the amazing things in New Zealand is, you know, just, just find a niche and just, just get amongst it, get passionate, and just, just like, learn to love it and, yeah. and just take over. Oh, like that. And obviously, man, you would have inspired so many, especially Kiwis around the world, oh, around, through the, throughout the country around getting into high jump now because like you say there was never a pathway for for high jump but now they've seen you on the biggest stage um, yeah i mean i don't want to underplay it like i i think there definitely has been um but like i said like i mean i'm just so passionate about track and field just Mm. as as a general sense and i think that you know like the likes of me and tom walsh and zoe hobbs and eliza mccartney like there's just so many amazing people you can look up to nowadays yeah like for me i think the true thing is yeah, it seems weird. Like I don't think my my kind of true success will be seeing how many people do high jump in a few years. It's yeah. probably more track and field. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Um, what can you standing box jump? <laughs> I 
I actually have no idea. Right? Is there like, a correlation at all? No, that? no, yeah. it's not. So, I mean, we take off on one foot. Yeah. Um, box jumps. I mean, you can do one footed box jumps, but we do two. Generally, it's two footed, and so and it's also just a different like conversion of energy. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a massive concentric element to a box jump. You know, you're pushing away from the ground, whereas we're almost trying to go in and and hit the ground and and break as hard as possible. Yeah, and so yeah, it's yeah. more eccentric, and oh, so. Yeah, so I'd say like probably like a running box jump would be something that would be more up my alley. But yeah. I did um, a couple of years ago, probably one of my only semi-impressive metrics in the gym is uh, I did, I think I did an 80 centimetre standing vertical oh, two-footed. Yeah. And then I did a 78 centimetre standing vertical one-footed. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. That's obviously your jumping foot. That's my jump. Yeah. <laughs> and then and the other <laughs> two centimetres. <laughs> <laughs> what could you, um, scissor kick? Um, scissor jump. I... Pro, I think officially I've done like 195. Um, oh, far off out. a short run up, yeah. So, I probably if I really wanted to, I could do maybe 205, 210. Wow, that's yeah. massive. Yeah, I mean, gen- the general the general rule is 30 centimeters less than your four three flop oh, far uh, PB is what you should be up to. Scissor. Jeez, I thought it would have been way um, harder, but no. Okay, how many kiwi birds does he reckon he can jump over if they're all stacked up on top of each other? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know, like 10, 15? <laughs> depends how big they are. Yeah, it depends, <laughs> depends how, uh, how brave they are, I guess. <laughs> okay, does sleeping really work between jumps like Basham does? Oh, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think um, there's, there's a massive uh, – so, yeah, we're out there for three hours generally um, yeah. for a big competition, and, and a lot of that is is how do you kind of conserve your energy, and, and some guys um, like the Qatari – you know, he he puts his head over his face and and, and you know, goes to sleep. But <laughs> I, I I don't know if he does actually go to sleep. I think I think a lot of that is is also the game. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you're if you're out there trying to attempt a third attempt, and he's popped out like a first attempt and then just gone back to sleep, like yeah, it, yeah. it definitely is pretty demoralising. And then, you know, like you finally get your third attempt, and then next round up, he's just like, oh yeah, I guess I got to do another one. Bang, first attempt, off he goes again. It's, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of games that get played out. How long is he? Jumping. How long would he have between it? Like twenty minutes? If yeah, he's being yeah, the first ru- one. Yeah. yeah, roughly. Like I mean, it would depend what height and how many people were in. But yeah, yeah maybe twenty. Crack up. Okay. Um, if you could play any other sport, what would it be? Oh. Um, Probably golf. Yeah, to be honest. Like, I heard you're quite yeah. a good golfer. I'm not a good golfer. I love golf. Yeah, uh, I'm terrible. But I, <laughs> no, I look. It's a great game. Um, and yeah, it's for me. It's it's a good place to work on my mental game. And yeah. and sort of yeah, there are there are actually um, comparisons that I take between the two sports. But mm-hmm. yeah, in terms of my um, my technical ability, it's yeah, it's a little bit lacking. <laughs> yeah, if I could be a golfer, <laughs> yeah, I it would be. <laughs> okay, last question: best piece of advice for a water lad listener? Um, I think I think one thing that I've really tried to to do this year and really lean into is just feeling the fear mm. um, and being okay with that. Uh, I think that yeah, for me, fear and and you know like the that kind of like oh shit moment um, just means how much it just it just kind of shows to me how much I me- it means yeah um, and and how you know how deeply connected I am to what I do um, you know if you're not scared of, of what you're doing then then you just don't want it mm. as, uh, enough as, as you probably should and so I think that's the thing it's like it's not shying away from that it's seeking out as many you know scary moments as you can and and just you know those are the moments where you'll just find you know some some really cool parts about yourself. Mm. Mate, what a powerful way to finish! An incredible podcast, man. That was that was some journey you took me on there, and uh, it's been so cool hearing hearing what you've been through to to come away with that gold medal that you've got now. So, um, yeah, and it's just been incredible to see sort of um, the influence you've had on. Like my kids do um, athletics now, and they were so, super excited to yeah. when I told them that you were coming <laughs> on this morning because they, they just loved that that moment in the Olympics so you've not just inspired like my kids but I know so many different um, kids around the country so it's, it's so cool to get you on and go through your story and hear the challenges and the um, the trumpets of what you've been through so awesome to get you on and um, go through it all. Yeah thanks man it's been yeah it's been an awesome chat we haven't even brought up rugby or cricket too much which is great <laughs> but <laughs> yeah it's yeah thanks for having me on. Hey, you're a lad.